Okay, we are live. I promised you guys in the morning email today that if you focused in this last hour and change of block, that you would be more effective and think differently about your job. And certainly, if you've been paying attention so far, that is the case. We're going to wrap this up with something that I am just so excited about. So Lori Weingart is the Richard M. and Margaret S. Syrett Professor of Organizational Behavior at Tupper. She's also was the interim provost for about a year and a half from 2017 to the end of 2018. And prior to that, she was the Senior Associate Dean of Education at Tupper. Um, I'll just say on a personal level on that in, in those roles, Lori really was the person who made it possible for us to start the Corporate Startup Lab. It truly would not have happened without her. And she continues to be a close personal advisor to me and to the Corporate Startup Lab. And I know that for a lot of people at Tupper and CMU, they feel the same way about Lori. Beyond that, her academic research is remarkable, both in the field, you know, its ability to transform organizations, and also academically. Her work examines collaboration and conflict and and many of the things she's going to talk to you about today. She also co-leads the Collaboration and Conflict Research Lab at Tupper. Just yesterday, it was announced that she was honored with the prestigious Interdisciplinary Network for Group Research Lifetime Achievement Award, which is like an amazing kind of recognition of her commitment to advancing this field. Uh, she's going to talk about collaboration and conflict and innovation teams today. I really want you guys to zone in and focus here for 25 minutes. Turn your email off. Just nothing but pay attention to the screen for the next 25 minutes. Uh, this is going to be really remarkable for you guys. Lori, thanks for doing this. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Sean. And I'm really thrilled to be able to work with the Startup Lab for so many years and to see it grow from an idea to reality. So congratulations on that. So I have two goals today in my talk. Uh, one is, is I want to share some of the things that I've learned through my research on interdisciplinary innovation teams. And then the second is I want to invite you to join me and my colleagues, you met Taya, by participating in some research that can generate new knowledge and improve collaboration in your own companies at the same time. So we'll get started here. So we know that innovation is done by teams. They're done by teams that pull from multiple disciplines and functional areas by necessity. And last week, as I was listening in on some of the sessions, I heard you know several references to the importance of the team. It might have been the composition of the founding team or how to tap the network to find the right people, expertise, or funding. But fundamental to many of these challenges is how we communicate in this interdisciplinary team and how we cross boundaries how we bridge our differences and expertise and experience to get the most out of the collaborations. So my research um, focuses on how this all unfolds within the teams. And I've looked at the dynamics of interdisciplinary design teams. I've looked at product development teams, project teams, research teams, and even we've worked on ICU teams to look at how people bridge their disciplinary and functional differences in order to more effectively collaborate and innovate. So that's what I want to share with you kind of at a high level today. So certainly that the challenge we focus and face on in any cross-functional setting is how to bridge those gaps or work across the boundaries. And any team member, you know, has to both work with others within their team who have very unique knowledge sets. And at the same time, these individual members in these corporate settings, you have to advocate back to the organization on behalf of your team. You're also communicating with potential customers on behalf of the team. So there's many boundaries that you have to cross where people will come in with very different perspectives and different knowledge bases. So the challenge is how to work effectively across those boundaries. So there's basically two uh, fundamental questions that my research has examined over time. So one is, how does interdisciplinarity influence our ability to be effective? And to address this question, I'm going to talk a little bit about the gaps that occur in cross-functional collaborations. So I'll do that first. And then the second question is, what can you do to bridge these differences and more effectively collaborate with one another and communicate with one another? Addressing that question, I'll talk about um, bridging gaps, both in terms of knowledge 
and in terms of the interpersonal relationships that occur between um, individuals. Both of these are necessary in order to communicate more effectively and also to manage the conflict that naturally arises, right? And for me, conflict is not a dirty word. Conflict is the grist of the mill. It it drives our effectiveness and ability to find innovative solutions. So we all know that interdisciplinary collaborations are really challenging. Team members come at problems from very different perspectives, from different thought worlds, and it colors the way we view the world. These differences translate into very unique understandings of problems, right? Our knowledge base influences how we interpret a problem and what we focus on. These differences will also result in difficulties understanding one another, communicating with one another, and bridging the gaps regarding what we think is important and how disagreements should be resolved, right? All these things are challenging. Think about the times you've sat in meetings where you didn't necessarily either agree or understand your counterpart's perspective. And of course, if these disagreements are not communicated constructively, it can lead to ineffective collaboration and very unproductive conflict. So in my remaining time, what I'm going to do is touch on each of these points, focusing on both the research I've done on perceptual gaps, um, how we bridge these differences in terms of what I'll talk about, uh, cognitive and affective integration. And finally, um, look specifically at conflict expression as a way to increase the likelihood that our disagreements will be more productive. That's what I'll focus on going forward. All right, so let's start with the main idea here that our unique perspectives, where do they come from? Why do we see the world so differently? Certainly they're influenced by all many facets of our backgrounds, our experiences, our training, our culture, maybe even our gender, the company we work for, our roles and responsibilities. In fact, what we do is build thought world diversity into our team. It's there by design. We bring cross-functional teams to innovation teams, especially together in order to capitalize on the synergies. And ideally, right, innovation occurs when these thought worlds collide, when we realize that, you know, maybe we can't solve the problem from one perspective, we can do better from multiple. And some people refer to this as creative abrasion, right? That somehow we have this magic that occurs in our interdisciplinary teams and innovation will result. Creative abrasion is just another word for conflict. It's the positive spin on it. And it can be positive if we're intentional about how we approach it. You know, when conflict arises, though, people don't naturally attribute it to our differences in perspectives. They often attribute it to difficult people. Why does Jason refuse to see things my way? Or Megan can be so stubborn. You know, what I argue and what I show is that these perceptual gaps are driving many of the conflicts we see in diverse teams. So like, here's an example that you might have observed in your work and and I've seen time and again in working with product development teams. These teams I'll refer to are where we have engineers and designers working together, right? So engineers are trained to find the right answer. They use quantitative methods to model, to understand and control the environment. They're very focused on function. In contrast, many of the designers I've worked with are more visual thinkers, They consider what should be, what could be, but not necessarily what is. For them, you know, aesthetics and emotional impact are an integral part and component of high quality product design. These are very different lenses from the engineers and the way they're viewing their product. And it results in really fundamentally different understandings, expectations, and assessments of their shared work. So really, it should come as no surprise that when um, all their goals can't be met simultaneously, they're going to have conflict. They might argue or they might dig into their favorite solution. So we ask, well, what can teams do to overcome these gaps? And I'm gonna talk about two main avenues for bridging gaps that are built into our innovation teams. The first is cognitive integration. So cognitive integration focuses on developing an understanding of one another's perspective. That is, you're trying to gain understanding of another's language, maybe their ways of reasoning, goals, constraints, priorities, right? Teams that are cognitively integrated are less likely to experience conflict 
as a result of their different perspectives. It doesn't change the differences. It just makes them more accessible to the other person. So to become cognitively integrated, I have to understand how you come at the problem, but I don't need to know what you know. I just have to understand your approach and your perspective. So given that, given that necessary shared understanding, how do you achieve cognitive integration? Like what can you do as a manager to jumpstart the process? So there's lots of different touch points and approaches depending on your team and the stage at which they're at in their development. You know, we think about issues of jargon and language, um, making sure people feel free to ask questions when they don't understand. People take the time to explain um, their uh, language, their approach, definitions, careful use of language, and so on. Or maybe they, you need to have a crash, cor- crash course in reasoning of alternative perspectives and the tools used and the ways problems are resol- solved. Um, even finding out about the other side's preferences, priorities, concerns, goals can help. As an example, um, a few years ago, I was brought in to work with the top management team. And this was at a continuing care facility. And they wanted to improve their collaboration processes. And it became pretty clear um, that while they often work together, they didn't have a good understanding of one another's perspectives and responsibilities. So we began with, you know, pretty simple intervention. Intervention. First, we identified where there was repeated conflict across the functions of in the departments. And then we got the leaders of those areas together to, to go to lunch, to interview one another, to learn about each other's jobs. We even had them shadow each other for a half a day to find out, you know, what are your constraints? What are the challenges that you're facing? Uh, what we did is provided them with the imp- impetus to step into the, their counterparts' shoes. Then they came back to the top management team and reported out on what they learned. And this really helped the whole team get more insight into the perspectives of their uh, colleagues. And interestingly, you know, these activities, which by the way, um, they were hesitant to participate in because they felt they didn't have the time. uh, It really paid off both in terms of increasing their understanding of one another and uh, their perspectives, their constraints, and it helped to, um, ease the future collaborations that occurred. So that's one example of um, bridging gaps through cognitive integration. The second avenue for bridging gaps is building what I like to refer to as affective integration uh, through increasing trust, respect, and liking. So teams that have more or stronger affective bonds, interpersonal bonds, are more effective in managing the conflict that does occur. Right? So it doesn't mean that the conflict or disagreement goes away, but when we do disagree, I'm going to trust that you're being honest with your opinion and have the best interest of the team in mind. I'll respect your approach to the problem and what you have to say, and I'll enjoy spending time with you. And if I enjoy spending time with you, I'm more likely to seek you out rather than avoid you. So we have evidence that affective integration can also help uh, bridge perceptual gaps and improve collaboration and innovation. Okay, so while um, cognitive and affective integration can bridge the gaps, as I said, they will not eliminate disagreement, nor should they. They don't make the disagreements go away, but they provide a context where the differences can be understood and effectively resolved. So this is going to lead to the last topic I want to touch on, which is the important role of how disagreements are communicated, the dynamic of a conflict expression. So team scholars, including myself, have studied the question of whether conflict is good or bad for teams. You know, the positive story is, hey, it's great. You surface all the disagreements you can, you figure them out, and innovation innovative solutions will result. Um, And in fact, the literature does support the idea that teams can be more, um, that have more task conflict, are more likely to be innovative. However, it's not guaranteed. The same conflict um, can disrupt team performance and the ability for team members to uh, listen to one another. And the key determinant of, of whether conflict will help or hinder teams is how the disagreement is expressed. So I want to talk a little bit about that. 
Okay. So there are two aspects of conflict expression that you should pay attention to. So one is the directness of how opposition is being conveyed. That is, how clearly am I communicating my disagreement with you? And the second is the intensity of that expression. That is, how forcefully am I conveying my opposition? So directness and intensity. And when you combine those two, it helps us understand the different types of conflict expression and the ways that they can potentially influence our ability to resolve conflict. Okay, so I'm going to talk about each of these four con- um, quadrants that result from looking both at intensity and directness. And these should sound pretty familiar to you. Okay, so the first is a situation where conflict is expressed very directly and with high intensity, right? This is something where we tend to perceive as people being very argumentative. And then when others reciprocate that, we get into arguments or fights or quarrels. So in these situations, it's pretty clear what we're disagreeing about, but it's communicating with such intensity that emotions are triggered, information may be biased. Basically, we often start stop listening to one another because we're too busy trying to defend our own positions, right? So we're sometimes talking past one another instead of to one another. So that's high intensity and very direct. The second quadrant is what I refer to uh, as undermining behaviors. So these are just as intense, but now people are more indirect and unclear in expressing their opposition. And there are lots of ways people undermine one another. So first, we might dismiss what the other party has to say. We could discount them. We could exclude them from um, consideration. Second, we could complain about them or denigrate them to others. We could backstab. That's another way we undermine. And another, what I think is really interesting uh, undermining behavior is teasing. Think about the groups you've been in where there's a lot of teasing. There's two ways teasing can go, right? In some groups, it can be a way to pull someone in to say, hey, I'm comfortable enough with you and you should be comfortable enough with me that I can make a joke at your expense and you'll still feel good about it and it's fine. Uh, And actually, we did a study of uh, emergency uh, medical technicians and we found that teasing was positively related to cohesion in the group. They felt connected to one another when there was teasing. So it was a positive um, um, dynamic. But on the other hand, and perhaps more often, teasing can be used to exclude another party and make them feel worse about themselves. Like this type of teasing, you know, it's more subversive and will have a negative effect on team cohesion. So we found this in a continuing care facility that we studied. Um, In fact, it's the one I referred to earlier because teasing um, is very ambiguous communication. It's indirect. Um, It's an indirect communication of opposition. Uh, The interpretation of it might also depend on the relationships that exist within the team. The third category we can think about is when um, there's low intensity and it's very indirect. So these are the subtle behaviors that people engage in to um, communicate disagreement um, where they're not really being clear about what the problem is. It's so subtle even that people may not even know what's going on. They might not be sure. You know, and when someone is being disguised in disagreeing with me or expressing conflict, I might wonder, hey, is that person dissing me? Like, you didn't show up to that meeting again. You came late again. You didn't respond to my email. Or maybe you're saying something, but I don't think that's what you really mean. I know there's some opposition, but as a recipient, I question my interpretation of your behavior. And this can lead to fear. It can lead to uncertainty and quite a bit of stress. So these are disguised conflict expressions. They're low in intensity and they're low in directness. Okay, so now we'll go to that gold standard, right? So what happens in situations then where um, we're direct in our disagreement, but now the intensity is brought down. These are the debates, deliberation, the back and forth. These are where people are not as entrenched in their position and open to other people's perspectives. Here's where they're much more able to move the conversation forward. And this is this clearly is the gold standard. 
When we think about all four approaches to the conf conflict expression, we can start getting at situations where we can move people towards more direct and less intense expressions. And research shows that this is, is the way to go, right? So we see um, when um, arguing, undermining, and disguise are occurring, conflict escalates and team functioning can suffer. Sometimes disguise actually limits the, our ability to surface our disagreements and resolve them. When we uh, rely on debate, whoop, there we go, and deliberation, right, we're able to support innovation by avoiding those conflict spirals, increasing information exchange, and decreasing the negative emotion. And it also results in higher positive energy in the team which then helps the information exchange and the innovation in turn. So to summarize, um, how can innovation teams collaborate more effectively, right? They can bridge perceptual gaps by uh, improving the cognitive integration, affective integration, and debate and deliberation. So with that in mind, um, I have an invitation for you. So uh, as my colleagues and I continue to do work in this area, we need your help to move this work forward. And at the same time, you can gain insight into the uh, conflict management and collaboration approaches in your team. So I think there's an opportunity here for not only for us to come in and help you um, determine where gaps might uh, exist in your team, where there might be opportunities for cognitive and effective integration, but more importantly, how are people um, expressing their disagreements and that necessarily arise and what can we do to improve their go-to strategies? Uh, uh, we've recent, Taya and I have recently launched a conflict and collaboration research lab, um, and we invite you to reach out to us, especially those of you who are coming from larger organizations that have lots of teams uh, where we can together do assessment of conflict expression approaches, what's working and not working, and what we can do to get your teams up to the most effective strategic approach. So with that, maybe we can bring uh, Sean back and it yeah. open up to a few questions. So, so uh, Laura, you can just say you'd rather not answer this, but Richard Citrin in the, uh, in the Q&A asked, have you found any differences between women and men leaders on a effective collaboration skills? Um, uh, I don't have enough. Yes, in collaboration skills. So women tend to lean more towards problem solving than more competitive strategies. Why is that the case? Um, generally, what the research shows is that women are more used to coming into conflict situations from lower power positions. And people who are come from these situations from low power positions uh, are recognize that they need to use collaboration instead of forcing strategies to get things done. Okay. So yes, uh, I don't, what I'd love to know more about is whether women are more likely to use debate and deliberation versus some of these other strategies or disguise. And I'd love to be able to collaborate with um, you guys, your organizations to answer that question. Yeah. Can you go back one slide? I want to just take a moment and just, frame a little bit more of what you're talking about. Um, so he here's another way to think about this for, for what it's worth, guys. So one of the things that you, s that you say to me all the time, audience says to me, Sean, director of CSL all the time, is I just don't know who to put on my teams to, to make us effective, right? And a lot of you actually come to the Schwartz Center and you look into the startup garages and you say like, oh, I think I should do what JJ is doing at Talk Me Up, right? And she's awesome. And there's probably a lot you can learn from her and you should probably use her tool. But it's unclear to me that how JJ is building Talk Me Up is the right way for Bosch or PNC or Philips to, to build out your groups, right? And I think this kind of invitation that Lori is offering you is a chance for you guys to help the world get better at answering that question while also helping your teams answer that question better. Cause I, I, and, and I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship as you guys know, but the answer is probably not a hacker, a hustler and a designer. 
like that works well in the short center garages. We've, you know, Dave and I and the whole team have done a great job, I think, sort of building that culture of doing that. I think there's more involved in this. And Lori and Tay, I think, could really help you guys answer that. So I just want to want to um, uh, encourage this. I see Estella Wu from Bosch already responding to this. Estella, I will connect you guys afterwards. But but um, and I've already gotten a text from somebody else about this. But um, Lori, if they want to reach out to to you to talk about this, what's the best way for them to connect? Uh, feel free to email me directly rather than using LinkedIn. I, I'm more of a email person. So just send an email to weingard at cmu.edu. Or if you're interested in talking to Taya more about her work, there's her email address. We also have a website listed here. And I think someone might have put it in the chat as well in terms of where you can find more information about the research lab uh, and what we've been doing and what we're trying to launch right now. So there's lots of opportunities. Awesome. Okay, and then yeah. uh, I'm gonna ask. Uh, I'm gonna ask um, also, if, Leah, if you can just share your your illustrations real quickly, and then we will move to the content weaving. Thank you so much for doing this, Lori. Great, and actually, my pleasure. all three of you. I mean, that sort of back to back to back was just awesome. So thank you. Great. I, I hope it was helpful. I think there's a, a, lots of great opportunities. All three of us mentioned about how. Um, academics and practitioners and organizations can link to yeah. jumpstart, you know, not just what we know about this, but best practices in, in companies. Sean, you and I had a conversation once about, and maybe this is part of the, you know, red thread weaving yeah. here, but we had a conversation once about, um, you know, how much do we really know about these behavioral yeah. aspects and how we're not getting our knowledge to you? And right. these are the ways we can get, you know, cross that chasm and, and close the gap. Yeah, I think people, so this is a little tip for the corporates on the on listening. I think many corporates think, oh, the answer is consulting engagements. What I found with a lot of academics is consulting engagements are fine. Like it's, everybody's capitalist, they like a check, but like data and opportunities to study these things and actually advance the field, you, you get a much when I think about those two different interaction models, you get a much higher quality engagement there. And I think actually can drive a, a little bit more meaningful change across your companies as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, we are going to move to the content weaving um, as we've been doing at the end of every day. So Lou Masanti is going to do that. And uh, again, as I've we've been saying when all the times so Leah's been facilitating, we'll make sure her illustrations are packaged up when we do this at the end. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you.